Hi everyone, this is Jen Grisanti and I am here with Ted Humphrey, who I am very excited to interview. Welcome, Ted. Thank you, uh, thank you for being here. So I am interviewing Ted Humphrey because he is going to be a guest speaker on my upcoming story therapy event. And I wanted you to get to know him. I wanted you to get a glimpse inside. I know when we do the guest speaker during the event that they don't get a lot of time. And I also know that so many of you get nervous with pitching and these interviews are a way for you to get to know these people uh, because they are pretty spectacular. My, my group of guest speakers, I feel so much gratitude for the time and energy that they put in to helping you learn about the business. So let me tell you about Ted. Ted Humphrey is a writer, producer, director, and showrunner, and the founder and principal of Algorithm Entertainment, a film and television production company based at CBS Television Studios in Los Angeles. Currently, he is the executive producer, co-creator, developer, and showrunner of the upcoming Netflix series, The Lincoln Lawyer, based on the Michael Connelly novels. He was previously the creator, showrunner, and executive producer of the CBS drama series, Wisdom of the Crowd, and is perhaps best known as a writer, director, and executive producer of the acclaimed CBS series, The Good Wife, as well as the showrunner, executive producer of the sci-fi series, Incorporated. He has written and produced series for many networks in both broadcast and cable, as well as several feature films. For his work on The Good Wife, he was honored with multiple Emmy, Golden Globe, and Writers Guild nominations for Best Drama Series, as well as a Writers Guild nomination for Best Episodic Drama Script and Voices of Courage and Conscious Award for the Muslim Public Affairs Council for his first season episode, Boom. Uh, the Good Wife also earned a Peabody Award and was twice honored with the American Film Institute's Award for Excellence in Film and Television. Ted is a graduate of Georgetown University and holds law and graduate degrees from the University of Virginia. He began his career as an attorney in Washington, D.C. before coming to his senses. I love that part of your bio. Okay, this is like mind blowing. Like I don't even know where to start with all of this. It is I can incredible. tell you, I can start with that bio was never meant to be read aloud. So. <laughs> But it's so good for people just to look at what is the trajectory, like where do you start and how do you make things happen? And I can tell you from being an executive when I met with you staffing wise, like to see your arc of growth in this business is incredible. So congratulations to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, truly amazing. Uh, so for the first question I want you to think about, now we talked about The Good Wife, which love, love, love. I honestly think it's one of the best pilots and shows ever done. It's wonderful to teach from because there is so much there. So when you compare your work on The Good Wife, which was for network television, versus your upcoming show, The Lincoln Lawyer, for Netflix, give us a glimpse inside of what differentiates the two processes as far as how you work? Um, they're so different, uh, which is weird because, right, you know, on some level writing is writing and the, the, the actual process of the writing is not so different, but everything else is so different. Um, you know, traditional network TV, and, and I would, I would uh, include in that most traditional cable TV, uh, broadcast, you know, whether that's FX or I did a show for sci-fi, for example, because it, it tended to be done on the same, in, in the same process that network TV was done in the same timeline that network TV was done um, versus working for streamers and, you know, certain premium cable outlets like HBO, I suppose, are, have always been closer to the streamer model in terms of how long things take and, and so on and so forth. Um, traditional network TV 
is a roller coaster ride uh, where you you begin in say May or June. It always it, it was it always stunk because um, it took your summers away. That was the really bad thing about it. Is that especially as a parent, you couldn't travel with your family in the summer because it was always a very oh, good that summer. is a hard part. Yeah, it was a really hard part. I don't miss that. Um, but anyway, what I do miss was, and it was one of the things that The Good Wife, we, we got a lot of attention for and a lot of acclaim for. And it was really kind of a happy accident that we, we would constantly do these episodes that would be really in the zeitgeist and sort of not ripped from the headlines, but actually like a little bit in anticipation of the headlines. Um, for, the, the best example I can always think of of that is we did an episode in 2011, I want to say, about Bitcoin, when nobody knew, had ever heard of Bitcoin or knew what Bitcoin was. And we did this episode about Bitcoin because one of our writers had read an article somewhere about Bitcoin and brought it in and was like, this is this new crazy thing. And we thought, oh, this is really interesting. Let's do an episode about this. And we did that episode and it was sort of, you know, a few months after that episode aired that suddenly Bitcoin was this big thing. So we, 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 we frequently appeared like we had our fingers on the pulse of what was going on, or we were even a little bit ahead of the tide. And I, I really do mean that a lot of that was luck, but it was um, the kind of ability you had in network television that you have an idea, you, you bring it into the writer's room, somebody writes a script and the timeline for when, between when you come up with this idea and literally when it's airing, not when you're shooting it, when it's airing on television, might be as little as three months. Um, we, you know, people would come in, in in September with an idea and it would be airing in December. Um, you, you would flesh it out, you would write a script all in a matter of six, six to eight weeks. Then you would almost immediately shoot it and edit it and it would go on the air. And so we, you really had this ability to um, like respond to things in real time. And the same was true with what you were doing on the show. If you had a character or a storyline that people liked, you could kind of react to that and write more to that. If you had a character and storyline that people, it seemed didn't like, you could react to that and write less to that or, or finish that storyline or that character earlier than maybe you were anticipating because it just didn't seem to be landing. You don't have any of that with, with um, streaming. Uh, the streamers, take forever to do things. They typically want, if possible, all the scripts in advance of when you shoot. We didn't end up doing that with the first season of Lincoln Lawyer because we just didn't have time, but uh, and COVID played a big part in that. But, um, you know, and then there's just this uh, glacially long time period from when you shoot things to when they air. I mean, we finished shooting the first season of the Lincoln Lawyer in August. We turned it over to Netflix in October, late October, I think. I mean, meaning we were done with post-production on it. I don't think it's going to air until June. So there's just this very long time period that the streamers take. Some of that is for technical reasons. They take a lot of time to um, dub things into different languages and, and so forth. Some of it is just because they have crowded release schedules. It's almost like a movie studio. They have these crowded release schedules and they want to decide when's the best time to release something and plug it in and so forth. So process-wise, they are very different. Story-wise, the biggest difference, I suppose, is that Netflix specifically has this binge model. And some of the others do not, and even some Netflix shows now do not. They're starting to release shows on a weekly model, some rather than a binge model. I personally like the weekly model much better. I think the best version of what we do in this business is what HBO and Showtime does. They do very high quality, highbrow shows, and yet they release them one week at a time and you build up that anticipation. I mean, when Game of Thrones was on, it was like you couldn't wait for the next you know, week episode of Game of Thrones. Um, the binge model, yeah, it's great if you want to sit and watch three episodes in a row, but, uh, and sometimes that's great, but um, on a storytelling level, it really does push you towards cliffhangers in each episode, especially if you're doing, as, as The Lincoln Lawyer is, a suspense thriller kind of show, because the model really does uh, focus around keeping people sitting and going into the next episode. That's sort of the point of it. And so they, they love to have like a little mini cliffhanger in every episode, which in traditional network TV, I would have found cheesy. We tried to avoid cliffhangers, but it works in the streaming model. Um, so that's a, that's a difference. I like that. I think that's fascinating. Well, I love what you tapped into as far as from 
the showrunner executive producer creative process, how network television, you're able to gauge and respond. You're able to see what the audience is connecting with, what they're not connecting with, and make creative decisions based on that. Like that's fascinating to me because I've never really thought of it in that light. And as a viewer, it's interesting because I think uh, as we all did, you got so into the binge watching that now that they're starting to go back, at first it was a little jolting to go, oh my God, I have to wait another week. But then you get back into, as you mentioned, the excitement and the anticipation of right. going, I can't wait till next week to see what the show is. Right. Yeah. So that, yeah. that go ahead. No, I, I think the I think the binge model, I mean, I don't want to be, you know, different streamers have done the binge model because it works for them business-wise and there are pros and cons to all of it. So mm -hmm. it's not that it's bad. Um, I don't personally love it. And I do think it contributes a little bit to this notion of content, you know, like Martin Scorsese talks about, it's not content. It's, you know, we're making films or, or television series. When you call it content, it sort of demeans it. Um, I do think it demeans it a bit. And I think that the binge model contributes to that a little bit because it's kind of like, oh, there's 50 of them and let's watch one now and watch one tomorrow and we'll watch one. There's, there's a certain specialness that's missing um, in that model to me, but maybe that's just me. I know different people. No, I agree with that. you because I think it's like something that's an event versus right. something that's just ongoing. I think right. there's a psychological aspect to both. And I, I think when you talk about also, I like that you mentioned the idea that it put more pressure on you for the cliffhanger with the streaming model. I think it's great for writers to be aware of that. And, you know, I would tap in, there was something else that I read that was fascinating to me that someone said, when you're working and streaming as a writer, you also don't get to produce your episodes at the same level that you do in network television. And that because of the timeline and that causes a lot of writers not to get the experience that they would. So, so it's all interesting, you know? Well, you know what, that's a great point. And one that I didn't speak to because I'm speaking from the perspective of the showrunner, but yeah, it's a really great point. Um, I don't know how honestly we are training the next generation of showrunners. Um, and I suspect the answer to that is we're really not. And we're, yeah. we're kind of throwing people to the wolves a little bit and, and certain people will, it's like sink or swim and certain people will learn to swim and other people will not. Yes. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe there was always some aspect of that to it, but I, I know that I benefited greatly from multiple years of 22 episode network television, not just financially in that it was, you know, you, you, you got paid to do that, but also the experience that you gained uh, being on set and producing those episodes, three, four episodes a season. Yes. Um, on up the ranks from, you know, story editor to co-producer, producer, whatever, you really gained a lot of experience so that when it did come your turn to be a showrunner, you were ready. Yeah. And um, nowadays people are doing these streaming shows and they're not getting the opportunities to produce those episodes. And that's, that's really unfortunate. And it's just a business reality of them. I faced this with Lincoln Lawyer because the writers are done and the studios don't want to pay them to hang around. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they just say, look, you do it. And so it, I'm certainly capable of doing it, although it'd be nice to have help, but the, yes. really it's not about me. It's about getting um, experience for these other people. So for the, for the, the next the generation that I'm hiring. And that know, is problematic. Of. It is. Yeah. So, so that, that is an interesting thing to think about. And that's why I'm happy that like HBO Max and Hulu are still doing the weekly thing so right. that there is hopefully an element of that still going on. Uh, now, okay, so let's see, writing from the beginning until now, if you were to think of some aha moments that you hit along the way with regards to how you write, what would you say they are? Gosh, aha moments. Um, well, one of them, you know, I started as a feature writer and back when 
features existed and people went to movie theaters and watched movies in the theater, which I hope <laughs> does not cease to exist completely, but I guess that's- Let's hope fun. not. Yeah. Um, but, you know, even, even before going to the movie theater became a dicey proposition, movies were, I don't want to say dying, but, you know, they were, it was becoming this business of temples and Marvel movies and, and, you know, not so many lower budget it was either like super, super indie movies or big, huge temples. There wasn't so much uh, the movies in between. And of course it used to be the case that, that feature writers could support themselves writing two or three or four, doing rewrites on two or three or four studio movies a year, that sort of thing. It just doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but I, I began my career in that aspect of the business for several years before segueing to television. And initially when I moved to television, you know, I didn't, this is the late nineties. Television was not nearly as honestly good as it is now. I don't think, I mean, we, you know, we, we, we've gotten so spoiled throughout the, the quote unquote golden age of television and into today with all of the um, incredible shows, some of which have incredible production value, but even, even some of the ones that don't are still just, there's a higher quality, I think of storytelling than maybe used to be there when it was just three or four broadcast networks and, and so on. And, um, but, you know, when I moved into TV, I had no experience with this production stuff that we're talking about. I had come from features and I had come from doing rewrites of features that maybe never got made and so on and so forth. And you were and a lot of them were kind of like big action science fiction movies, things like that, where you were encouraged to write the biggest, craziest scenes you could. And so um, I remember coming into television and writing my first episode of television on a show, which was a show called Now and Again that was on CBS, that was created by- I remember by Glenn, it, yeah. Yeah, so it was created by Glenn Gordon Karen, um, who had done Moonlighting many years before and, and uh, since then did Medium and, and eventually Bowl, I think, and now is pretty much, I think, retired. But uh, I wrote that first episode and whatever I wrote into it, I don't remember what it was, but it was like way too big to be produced. <laughs> and I, I will be gentle here because uh, he was not gentle at the time, <laughs> but, uh, and that's a whole other story that I won't get I into. I worked on medium. So yes, I well, do there you know. That's a whole other story yes. that I won't get into at the moment, but, um, <laughs> but among the, among the issues that he had with that first script is he said like, this is not producible. And of course he was about that. He was hundred percent right. There were other things he wasn't hundred percent right about, but that he was hundred percent right about. And it was just not a skill I'd ever learned. Right. And so he was like, we can't, you know, the budget for the entire season wouldn't shoot this sequence, right? And I had to learn what it meant to write to a budget, what it meant to, um, you know, when you, this is actually something he taught me that is really smart. Um, you know, he said, I, it, it, this is something he said he learned early in his career, that there are these very talented people, production designers and prop masters and uh, uh, set designers and, you know, so on and so forth, location scouts, right? And so that when you write something, it's their job to make it happen. And they look at it and they're just going to go out and find these things. And so we have to be really clear and detailed about how we write things to give them as clear a roadmap as possible to make it as producible as possible so that the line producer, the line producer's head doesn't explode when they read it, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So that was one, that was I one very that. early aha moment I had about like, um, now, interestingly, though, you know, you might hear that and you might go, oh, uh, the, the, the bean counter is killing your dreams, right? Well, it's not. It's just, it's just um, it doesn't kill your dreams. It just applies a filter to them where, and this is a skill you have to learn to be a showrunner. You're given a budget and you have to write to that budget and you have to find a way to produce your show on that budget. Um, and unless there's a serious problem which I have experienced on some shows where the, the there's just a shortfall between the budget and what the show is supposed to be but you know assuming you work that out and you have a budget that is reasonably sufficient to to produce the show um you've got to find clever ways to do things that don't break the don't break the bank you know yeah yeah no and that that's a huge thing that I think a lot of writers really need to understand how to learn that so yes. staying in the lens of the showrunner, because I, I love this and because you have been a showrunner on so many shows, when you, as a showrunner, when you have a writer's room full of people pitching ideas, and if you were to think of 
three things, let's say, that, that helped the pitching process, what would you say they would be? Well, I'd have to differentiate between pitching in a writer's room for a show versus pitching to a studio or a network or a streamer. I would love that. I would love to hear you talk about one versus the other. Yes. Sure. Um, I mean, really quickly, pitching for a show. If you are on staff of a show, always remember you are not there to make the best version of the show that you think you can make. You are there to make the show that the showrunner wants to make. And by, by extension, the show that the network and studio want to make because they've entrusted the showrunner with that responsibility, right? So you always have to pitch anything you want. I mean, you know, this, this, is, this, this differs from show to show and from showrunner to showrunner, obviously, but I would say in a, in a show that I'm writing, pitch anything you want, but if it gets shut down, move on um, and, and, you know, figure out as quickly as possible. It's a huge skill. Um, what's, what's working and what's not in the storytelling of the show in the writer's room, right? And go with what's working. Um, so that's, that's my advice to people on staff. When it comes to pitching to studios and, and networks, when it comes to pitching your own original show, you know, first of all, you're a storyteller. Remember, you're telling them a story. You're not laying out a blueprint of... Uh, how to build a house or something, right? You're telling them, be a storyteller, engage them. Um, helps to have some acting experience or if, if not fake it, even some public speaking experience, anything. Um, you know, writers sometimes are not so good at those things. Other times they're great, it depends on the person. Um, if, you, if, it's, if it's something that's not your natural strength, develop it, practice. Um, you want people to feel like you're telling them the most interesting story in the world and they can't wait to hear what happens next. Um, as, as part of that, I would say, whenever possible, use visual aids. I mean, in, in the old days of, uh, you know, pre-pandemic of like, you went in and actually met with people in person, I would bring in photographs of um, actors who I felt would be good templates for the characters. Usually I would pick like big movie stars because it doesn't really matter who, you know, specifically who you cast. You'd rather say Brad Pitt and kind of everybody knows, well, we're not actually going to cast Brad Pitt, but it gets them all excited. Like, oh my gosh, Brad, you know, as opposed to showing them the minor TV star that you might actually cast in your show. Um, there, you know, sometimes there's exceptions to that, but photographs of actors are great or photographs of key locations or, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a heavily, uh, you know, like a science fiction or, or some kind of show like that, you might actually um, do drawings or find artwork out there that, that illustrates the, the, the fantastical thing, whether it's in outer space or whatever that you're trying to, to pitch. Um, hit the high points, don't hit all the points. Um, you, you know, again, keep it, keep it relatively as brief as you can. I really like to pitch a pilot story, especially for a serialized show. Sometimes it differs from show to show. If it's a procedural show, you don't necessarily have to do that because it's more important to pitch what's gonna happen every week and who the characters are. But I, for me, I've always had success pitching a really gripping uh, pilot story, hopefully really gripping pilot story that people latch onto. And then in the course of that story, I introduce the characters rather than starting with this big long winded, here's the 10 characters and then going to the story kind of thing. And then the last thing I would say is just always leave them wanting to know what happens next, either, either on a plot level, on a character level, or ideally both. But um, you know, if it's a more character-based show, it doesn't have to be on a plot level, or if it's a procedural show, it doesn't have to be on a plot level, but then on a character level, leave them wanting to know what happens next. Excellent, I love that. So I love the idea of engaging your audience, knowing how to tell a story. I love the idea also of tell the pilot story. I always think like, even if you're just telling the teaser or the climax, you are a storyteller. So you have to bring them into that before you're going into, as you mentioned, the long list of characters, which often you lose your audience during that point. So, so it is so important to engage them. And then I always love leave them dying to know what's happening, what's going to happen next, because that's going to bring your audience back. So, and I love the visual too, because that is becoming, I noticed in uh, the teleseminar, I've had two people so far use presentations and I'm, I see the value 
I mean, there, there is a value if everything visually comes together in a way that works for the story. So I, I love that you tapped on that. Okay, last question. Again, through the lens of the showrunner, when you're thinking about personality traits uh, that work well in the writer's room versus might get in the way in the writer's room, what would those be? Uh, you know, they're kind of all the things our grandmothers taught us, I guess. Uh, play well with others and, and be kind and uh, don't be annoying. Um, that, you know, it, it, uh, I really look for people, first of all, I really look for, obviously it's a baseline that I look for talented writers. So the first thing before you're even gonna get in the door to have a meeting, you, you need to have a good script um, or ideally more than one even. Um, and, you know, grab a potential showrunner with what you can do on the page. Then once you've got that meeting, it's about how do you fit in with the showrunner's personality, but equally importantly, if not more so, with the personalities of everybody else in the room. Obviously, it can differ from show to show. If, I, if I'm doing a legal show, I'm going to need a certain number of people who have some legal experience. If I'm doing a show with a particular kind of character. I might want people who are like that character in some way. Um, but in general, I just want people who are who are obviously talented writers, right? Nimble thinkers, um, people who can pitch stories and then pivot depending on the, the circumstances. Um, being flexible is super key. Uh, you can always tell sort of a, a, a neophyte writer versus somebody who's been doing this for a while by how flexible they are. When the thing that they pitch doesn't work, can they quickly adjust and pitch something else or can they take that idea and adjust it and pitch it in a slightly different way to make it work? Or are they just gonna, you know, if you pitch the same idea four or five times, that's just not gonna fly with anybody. Nobody wants to hear that. And um, you, you'll quickly kind of find yourself in the corner uh, metaphorically speaking, I guess. Um, and it just it, people who work hard, but roll with the punches, right? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I have a, I hope, I think, I have a reputation for being a really um, pretty gentle and uh, decent person to work with. I don't like to work super long hours. That's especially true now over Zoom. Uh, God, I hope we get back to in-person writers rooms soon because I find this medium while it has its advantages and conveniences, uh, I find it stultifying ultimately in terms of trying to run a writer's room. And we had to do the entire first season of Lincoln Water this way. Wow. So we did it. I mean, we did it yeah. and other shows did it. It's not impossible. It's just, it's hard. Um, yeah. There are tools to help you do it. You have like online whiteboards versus being in a room and having boards you can write on or whatever. But um, I didn't love it. I mean, there are, it's weird. There are writers who worked on the first season of the Lincoln Lawyer who I never met in person. Who <laughs> I, you know, we had a room from before the, the, the pandemic because the show technically started before the pandemic. So there were a few writers that I had worked with in person for some period of time before the pandemic. But then we hired some other people who I never met in person. And uh, wow, yeah. And you know that they were and they were great but it's just sort of weird that to this day i've never met them someday i'm going to run into them and i'll barely recognize them you know it's, I, don't, yes. I only know them as little squares on a screen it's very strange um but be that as it may uh you know generally i would just say be kind be easy to get along with be flexible um you know stand up for the ideas you believe in but don't be rigid about it and uh and and you know remember that you're there you're not there to make your show. You're there to make the showrunner show and the streamer show, right? When when you become a showrunner, you'll be there to make your show, and then you'll be in the same boat of having to hire other people to help you make that. You know, um, the flip side of that from the from the showrunner's perspective is I try and um, give people as much responsibility as I can, give them as much ownership as I can, and I'm and this this goes not only to writers but to actors as well. Like a lot of a lot of writers don't don't love the, the process of collaborating with actors, it may not be their favorite part of the process. For me, it actually is one of my favorite parts of the process. So I really love to empower people to take ownership of it and, and kind of make 
the show there is all within, you know, part of my job is obviously to guide that and shape it to what I think it needs to be and what I think the, the studio or network want it to be. So, yeah. You touched on so many incredible things. I love that. I, I And I do want to affirm that, yes, you do have a stellar reputation oh. for how you work with people. So how important that is for everyone to be aware of that. So thank you so much. If I can graduate sharing. from this business with that reputation and nothing else, I'll still be happy. I And that's perfect. And in the idea of just be kind, I mean, so yeah. important, be flexible, be open, ready, bounce back. I mean, the, these are, these are so many things that, that are so true and carry so much weight if people can get these, you know, and if the ego can be pushed to the side so that yeah. the creative process can work. This business is a is a lifelong lesson in pummeling your ego into submission. I yes. just warn everybody in the seminar that right now, not just yes. from servers, but from like the whole business. It really is. You have to have a thick skin to survive this business. Um, but there's good, good that comes with having a thick skin, right? It's good to, it's good to get out of your own head and to not take yourself too seriously and to realize, eh, okay, you know, we're not the arc of growth. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> on the page and in the room. What on a the difference. page and in the room. We're not curing cancer. Yes, exactly. Yes, you are absolutely right. Well, thank you so much for your valuable time. This is going to give so many people the opportunity to learn what it is to write through the lens of the showrunner. So I want to thank you. And I can't wait until you are the guest speaker on March 1st. I am looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to seeing your new show. Uh, thank you very much. Um, right. I'll, I'll keep you posted. All right. All right. Sounds great. Bye. Take care. Tim. Have a great day. Mahalo. Bye. You too.